and welcome to the latest episode of the Leadership Untitled podcast, the show that brings together experts from the world of leadership and or HR, L&D, and hopefully shares tips and experiences that help you guys avoid the traps that all of us have fallen into at some point in our careers. This week, my guest is Lisa Hager. Lisa titles herself as the HR coach tasked with putting the human back into HR and is one of the most energetic voices on LinkedIn in trying to achieve that. Earlier this year, Lisa founded the HR Couch, a pioneering new way of learning, sharing, collaborating and changing the way we work in HR and as leaders to become more people centric. But where has that human gone? Was it ever there? Whose responsibility are the people anyway? They're just a few of the topics I'm looking forward to exploring as I welcome Lisa to the show. Hi Lisa, welcome to the Leadership Untitled Podcast. How are you doing today? Thanks Rob and it's great to be with you and thanks for asking me to come on. Thanks for coming on. It's uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, I, think, I always like to just use this first part just to explain why it is that I've, uh, I've reached out to people. Um, and, and in your own case, it's uh, I, I'm a big user of, of LinkedIn. Um, you've seen the stuff that I've put on there as well. And there's there's voices that stand out in the in the people that I, I follow and uh and one thing i appreciate more than anything in in people my number one kind of value if you will is is a consistency um and uh, you know certain people i follow on there sometimes that they, they, they kind of back for one side then they kind of like i don't know i think that side and i don't mind the debate but it seems like their entire opinion changes depending on how they've been challenged uh, whereas with yourself I, I get that really consistent feeling about what it is d- drives you in the world of HR particularly, um, and also the, the 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 passion around it being around the, the people and the person behind all of this rather than the, the business itself. So uh, from that sort of side of it, obviously the, the, the podcast is Leadership Untitled. Um, so the, the opportunity to explore that type of thinking uh, and then also from a kind of self-management point of view of yourself and why you believe that way and what you do to work that way, as well as how we think other leaders could do similar, it, it just seemed like a no-brainer for me to, to reach out to you. Okay, well, that's great. I, I do, um, you know, what you get online is is me, um, and I appreciate that I'm not everyone's cup of tea. I, by my own admission, call myself Marmite, so <laughs> some people really get me, some people don't. Sometimes, um, you know, I get uh, a lot of encouragement um, from people saying that if I'm inspiring because I have a voice, and I use it in the right manner, um, and I encourage a lot of HR people, and I'm the person that comes out and says the things that everybody else would like to, but they can't, just for different mm-hmm. reasons. Um, and then I also get a number of people, uh, even when I was interviewing last year for, for jobs, was told to dial back the Lisa, because although I have skills, they weren't comfortable that I am a strong female. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's always a, a, an interesting debate. Um, but I am what I am. Um, I, I don't make any apologies of who I am, what I am, um, and what I I say is is how I feel at the time mm-hmm. um, and, I, and I truly believe it and I stick with it um, and as a result of that I, I love what I do um, and I don't feel that I have to be submissive or apologetic in any way um, mm-hmm. like I said mama you either like it or you don't so if you do great and if you don't walk on by scroll past ignore mm-hmm. delete block whatever is your thing yeah, um, yeah I, I don't say anything offensive but I do say some things that actually make people think um, and get some real debate going on topics that we should be talking about and I call out my own industry which is I call out people in HR not individuals but as a whole because mm-hmm. um, we there are so many areas we need to do better uh, we can't mm-hmm. sit here and say that we're perfect in every way because we're not mm-hmm. um, so again that just sort of comes into how I sort of think about the constant improvement of what are we doing why are we doing it how are we doing it and then the impact on other human beings as a result of that because last time I checked the word HR stood for human Mm. Um, and I think somewhere along the way we've lost some of those messages for sure. Absolutely. It's part of um, when I talk about uh, the leadership stuff and the, the, the things that I do, um, I, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a strange relationship, really, because I kind of think about it like new businesses as they scale or begin to scale. They've, they've mastered certain things. They know that they, that they need a product and they know that they need to be able to sell that product uh, and they know that they need people um and to support those products uh, and when that's quite small the old sort of like there's a there's, there's 10 people in a room in a someone's garage starting the business that's all nice and very easy and it kind of comes naturally all that stuff that don't put much thought into the people stuff because it's just all very much more informal and everyone's everyone's 
utterly believing in the product and the business because they're there that early. And then as it starts to scale and you suddenly realize you need another 100, 150 people to make this a reality and the next round of funding comes in, decisions are made and you suddenly get a director of sales and you suddenly put in place a director of tech and a director of the product uh, development. And then it comes to the people bit and they go, oh, all right, well, might be time for HR. Okay, we'll do that. But at that moment, the way I kind of see it, I'd be interested to hear your take on this, is that I see that the other areas, the CEO and the top, the top branch there kind of go, I'm still very much interested to the nth degree in the detail of all those things. I need to know everything about our sales and our product and our tech and our marketing and all that. But when it comes to the people side of it, it's more that you just update me when you think you need to know anything. I've, I've almost abdicated all responsibility for people to that new department that's come in. Is, is that something you see or, or, or see around? Yeah, I, yeah. so I've worked with uh, startup scale-up and SMEs for 30 years. Um, and that's very much what happens if you don't. And a lot of people say to me when they start off, you know, at what point should we get HR in? Is it 10 people? Is it 50 people? Is it 100 people? And the answer is depends on your organisation. Mm. Depends how serious you are about. If you know nothing about the um, what you need to do to have a solid mission, vision, why they're important, you know, what the foundations of the business are, how to articulate that, the importance, genuine importance of culture, not just saying that you want a nice culture, putting some values on the wall and thinking the jobs are good. Yeah. Um, then it's so depending on what your business is and how serious you're about that, then then there is no time of the right time. Mm. It depends on, like you say, um, I'm working with a business at the moment and it's um, eight people. Mm. And some people say, well, you're in as a consultant for eight people. Yes, I am, because the CEO is so focused on um, having the right culture, building the right environment, so that that is already ingrained in the business. And so as people come in, We've sorted that out and they come into something which looks different, feels different, how we behave different, how we treat each other is different. Um, yeah. But we've already got that solid foundation. So everything that come in and they'll not just have onboarding as a, um, you know, onboarding as a sense of learning about the business, but they'll spend an awful lot of time with myself going through. This is how we treat people. This is how we speak to people. This is how we communicate here. Mm. It's not what you're used to. We don't have line managers, for example, this particular company, because we don't believe we need them. We empower you to be a grown up. We hire grown up. We hire talented people. We're going to leave you to get on and do your job. Yeah. Um, but because in the remote world, it's different and we have to communicate in a different way etc um these are the things that we do and these are the things that we expect you to do and behave and and this is how we, we reciprocate so um there's never a right time to get an agent but yeah as soon as you start getting into sort of 50 to 100 um when you start getting department heads again it comes back to they may be leaders they may be great people like director of sales and maybe fantastic outfacing people yeah who are very good with customers and clients and building a network yeah. um but then again that's not necessarily a guarantee that they are good with their internal people yeah, um absolutely. and but the same way as, as they should be because i always say to people we spend millions of pounds on marketing on that customer experience that cx experience we always find the time and we always find the money in a business for marketing um, so that the customer, what they see, what they get, the service, the product, whatever it may be, mm. is uh, the best experience that they can have. So they either uh, they buy first time, they repeat customers, they refer us to other people, all of that customer experience, that's what sells your product further. Um, and for me, I do that in reverse. I do that for the internal people yeah. because I believe it's a two-way street. And so while you've got experts in your own area, so many, you've seen it yourself, Rob, so many people will uh, either promote somebody or come somebody in and call them a director um, and expect them to be good leaders and people centric and all of those things. Respectfully, if they've never been um, had training or any development or, or anything in that area, then that's unfair to give somebody a title and all of the people responsibilities in place of HR if they've never had that development or they've never sort of been challenged on the way that they work they might be a brilliant salesperson but they might be uh, an ask to work with mm. uh, plus that immediate yeah, pressure that on happens. someone immediate yeah. pressure on you to go how do i now distinguish myself from the other people in the organization you know the ones i was potentially working alongside yesterday what now makes me different to the person i was yesterday and unless that development is there to actually guide them with that and i don't mean show them on a course on day one i mean you know well before that the, the develop, type of development that's helped you identify in the first place that this person was a good leader um, 
um, unless that's there, they're, they're going to make their own ways of showing that they are now the leader. And that's where I, can, I think they kind of often fall in those, those traps of more draconian, command and control, kind of proving that I, I need to be the one with all the answers, which up front kind of alienates the people below, but also then kind of like puts a lot of stress, I find, on, you, on yourself as well to kind of not be yourself. I mean, you've, you've mentioned there that what you see is what you get and you're yourself, whether it's on LinkedIn or whether it's in business. I, I find that if I'm trying to be someone I'm not, to try and get something done or to try and prove something. I find that quite tiring and quite stressful eventually, if not immediately about, about yourself. Is that one of the drivers? To, did you learn it easy to be yourself all the time? Uh, to be honest, uh, I don't know how to be anything else, uh, but I, I do see it. I have seen it on many occasions where, like you say, people have tried to fit into a mold that they feel that they've had to for, for whatever circumstances. Um, and it's exhausting, I think, is the word. And obviously I coach a lot of people. So, uh, again, that's associated when, when you try to be something that you're not mm -hmm. and you, you feel that you've had to that authenticity has had to sort of be put in a box whilst you um, appear to be what, what, you know, whether the boss or the business needs you to be at that time, yep. um, holding that together and, and being fake, but, you know, trying to keep in with the right people um, and, and, you know, be a face that fits. It's exhausting. And after a while, it's not sustainable. So, of course, it will do add stress, pressure um, on, on anybody. And that's just not a healthy way to be. Yeah, absolutely. It, you kind of think, I was using examples of like the building trade, that if you go and put something in that fits into a wall, but isn't necessarily strong enough to hold it, it fits though, so we'll leave it there. Um, you know that somewhere down the line, be it tomorrow or be it in a couple of years' time, you're going to have a bit of a disaster on your hands. It's, yeah, because it's, it's like building a, building a house on a, on a pile of sand, isn't it? it the, mo the moment it gets too heavy, it's yeah. going to shift, it's going to wobble, and it's going to, it's just going to, the bottom end of it is just going to fall out. Absolutely. Um, and, and people are expensive, you know, to hire, to develop and all of that. So it's, you know, I always say to people, take your time when you're scaling up to get the right people. Don't start to panic and think, OK, we need somebody in, in a month's time because this work's coming in. OK, well, then if you really are against it, have somebody short term, have a contractor in just to fill a gap. But when it comes to your permit staff, just take the time to get the right person. Uh, that's skills and fit in terms of. Again, depending on what the company wants, if it's consistency, um, you know, whatever the skills are. So it's a, it's a number of things about, again, mm. because you can teach anybody anything. I truly believe that. Um, but when it comes to behaviours um, and, and that sort of DNA, then that's in somebody. And then it's very, very difficult to change somebody's behaviours. Mm. It's, um, it's that flicking, it's just flipping that... Um... Uh, the mindset piece really flipping the order of things rather than bringing people in because they can do a job and you they're going to be able to do what you want them to do and then try to get them to believe what you believe down the line which invariably ends with why don't they care as much as i do yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um if you actually bring people in who believe what you believe and are passionate about it and then help them and teach them and train them and coach them to to get to those skill sets that you need you find the next bit a lot easier yeah, no, I definitely believe that. And same as the sort of, you know, you mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, training people and developing people. Um, again, from, from my point of view, again, and this is from real data, I've just speaking to so many people, mm -hmm. there's too many companies investing in the word training yeah. um, who have an off-the-shelf, um, one-fits-all, especially when it comes to their management development. Yeah. Um, and I've seen some, you know, very expensive courses being offered out to people, tens of thousands of pounds from very big, um, you know, big named um, you know, education providers to say mm -hmm. that we, we can provide this. Um, and while it covers some of the topics in a generic sense, what it doesn't mm -hmm. do is it doesn't put it in context in that work environment with the people that are currently there, with the CEO. That's well. And all of those, you know, we, we already know, okay, uh, behavior is contextual driven. Yeah. So you change the context, you're going to change the behavior. So it's okay having somebody who may be very calm and collective and put them in a different environment and they're, they're going to they're gonna change by default. So having one fits all, um, while it will cover some of the belt and braces things, um, I would rather they turn around and say, actually, we're not going to do that. We're going to give you a, a, you know, a personalized coach who will talk through your history, will talk through where they are as a company, and help fill the gaps that they need because um, I might be experienced in, in recruitment, whereas you might need a bit more on recruiting lower level people because you've always recruited senior people. There's, there's a difference. Um, but actually identifying that as an individual, what they need 
and then um, educating those parts to fill the gaps, I think is more meaningful, makes sense, and actually um, return on investment, which obviously, you know, the, the bean counters, bless them, will always yeah. be screaming out for. Um, it, it ticks that box as well, because it's, it meant it's very bespoke, it's very individual, and it's also very motivating um, for the person having that, because it makes more sense. And also, we don't know about any neurodiversity the person has. So if somebody's dyslexic or dyspraxic or um, has Asperger's, none of the off-the-shelf stuff um, to even considers any of that. Mm. So by doing it on a one-to-one, on a lot more very personalised uh, journey, um, you're able to have that open honest conversation, build a very, very good relationship, find out their particular style of learning and adapt what you can teach into that. It's very difficult to do it in a room full of 30 people. Yeah. Um, you know, you'll do the mainstream, you'll do anybody who's, who struggles a little bit, you might have to sort of do a little bit extra. Anybody who is very, very super bright, they're going to be bored halfway through because their brain mm. works at a rope of knots and they're already past that. Yep. So you, like any of you'll go mainstream, but but that doesn't offer the best um, you know, investment and it certainly doesn't mm. give the person who's learning the best experience. So it comes back to that, you know, the people experience. Um, and so I'm a big advocate of that rather than let's put everybody on a training called management mm. training program uh, because one fits all because it doesn't. No, no, no. It, it, it's about what people want to get out of this stuff. I mean, quite often it's one of, one of the failings around leadership and management in organisations is that it, it focuses too much on the results rather than the people. And, the, and then a, and a byproduct of that when it comes to training is what's the what's the easiest, fastest and most cost efficient way to, to get this new skill or whatever it might be out to people. And, and invariably that tends to be in their mindset that's been created, training. We'll just throw everyone on an e-learning and bump in half an hour, they've got it all. Um, but as you and I both know, you kind of do that and then people don't get it. And then you're having to run loads of performance management situations and then you're having to do the retraining. I hate the retraining. And then as you say, kind of, you know, domino rally this right through to the end, people who become engaged, disengaged might then leave. You're having to do, associate the costs with that. You're having to associate then the costs for bringing on new people and onboarding them again. And then obviously the upskill time and on and on and on and on. When, you know, if, if we actually did the maths on this sort of stuff, and I've personally done maths on sort of certain specifics of it, but if everyone out there just spent a moment and looked at the true cost of that training, now, it doesn't mean that it's always wrong to train, but you look at the actual real cost of what that has cost you over the course of the 12-month period and compare it to some of the other things maybe that you you turned away. Uh, and I know we've spoken previously around things like coaching, which up front doesn't appear to be the big impact thing, but over the course of that same 12 months, what the cost against what the actual benefit will be, it suddenly makes a lot a lot more of a different viewpoint if you if you do that maths up front. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, well, we don't have two different, different companies. We've obviously offered a, a you know a leadership course for the company versus actually um, give me that stack of cash, let me do it in a different way. And although it was like an umbrella company, so there's like three companies underneath it, we did two a completely different way to see actually what the impact was. So we've actually done it in, in a live environment to see what the impact was. Yeah. Um, and again, it was found that the, the one-to-one out, outperformed because we really understood what the performance was, what they needed, how they needed it. Um, and then we did a number of workshops on you know things like confidence and actually uh, self-awareness, which was a huge huge breakthrough for so many yeah. um and and things like that and, and the outcome was was far greater um it, it just was i say so we, we've done you know we've gone and said well i need you to trust me to do that we'll do it the traditional way mm. and then actually we'll think about it in a different way um and see what results give you um it, it was a huge success so that's why i talk about it you know with with a lot of passion because we've we've done it in in you know and seen the results firsthand yeah. It's funny you should mention that cost because, again, I'd say to anybody who works in HR, you know, I get that a lot of people think, you know, data and numbers are, are quite boring, but they're very, very important to learn how to understand them, what they mean. Mm. Um, and so anybody sort of from HR listening, if you're not involved in the numbers of the business, get involved with the numbers of the business, ask to sit in on some finance meetings, ask, you know, what does that mean? What does that yep. tell us? What? Why is that important? Um, and if they say no, no, we don't think it's your place to be in the room. Okay, well, 
for now, I'd say, okay, but um, the same way is if you don't ask, they're not going to invite you to understand. So if there's areas where you, you don't understand the business, get to know the business first and get involved and ask to get involved. Be brave and sort of say, can I sit in that meeting? Can I just observe? It's mm-hmm. part of my, my learning. Um, because we did an exercise where we costed out from the moment somebody said, I need another person in my team. Mm-hmm. So that was the, okay, the time to sort of develop the job description, go go through HR to the recruiter, time of recruitment, interviews, who was involved in the interviews, manager's time, onboarding, settling somebody in, showing them the the ropes of the business and the the initial kind of onboarding and and ongoing training. Mm -hmm. And we did that for a period of 12 months. And we did it uh, at like six different roles across the business. They were just random. So said, let's, let's just see what that looks like. And so that was just before COVID. We just finished that exercise. On an average, it came to when we did that and then did that sort of a life cycle of, of a five-year employee. But on average, um, it ended up being just over 2. I think it's 2.1% or something of their annual salary. Yeah. So every time somebody leaves, um, if they're leaving because they're not right, um, then that's not a loss to the business, I'd say, people, because sometimes you have got a square peg round hole and you are dealing with people, and that does happen. It's a reality, whether we like yeah, it or not. But that said, um, but again, then you'd have to look back and go, okay, what could we have done differently? What did we learn? How did we miss that? And it's not a failure. It's a, it, I don't believe in things like mistakes. I believe in there are opportunities to learn what could have done differently yeah. and look inside and say, let's have a look at that. But, but on average, so if you think about how much it costs for the employee to sort of from A, a to B, um uh so that when you're in a meeting and you talk about you know hr you talk about dashboard you're talking about um attrition and it's at four percent that doesn't sound particularly high but when you say that 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 four percent equates to seven hundred thousand pounds guess what everyone else in the room has dropped their pen fell off the chair and is now listening because if that was people that you you weren't fussed about losing and and again there will be people that you're not fussed about losing because they're not right for your business it may be in the beginning but you've changed, you've grown at a different pace, they, and they've not fitted in with a new business or, or acquisition maybe, or anything like that. Um, but it's still a cost. But then, but then the people that you didn't want to lose, mm. look how much it's cost you. It's a yeah. huge amount. So, so do the work up front. Mm. Make sure that you understand what it is that you need, who it is that you need, why it is that you need them, and, and how they fit into to what you're doing now. But also, I, I often say to people, don't recruit for now, recruit for the future. Mm. Think about your business in six and 12 months time. What's it going to look like? What is it going to feel like? Um, Describe that to me and then recruit for that point in time rather than where you are right now. Because businesses, SMEs move very, very quickly. They're very agile businesses. They do change quickly. And for some people that can't handle change very well, Mm. um, they don't fare that that journey very well either. So always recruit looking ahead like you Mm. do your driving. You don't look at your dashboard, do you? You look yeah. Uh, you know, further down the road. And I say that, take that mentality for recruitment because yeah. it will save you an awful lot of money in the, in the long run. And I think, and I think that's key that, you know, the translating, I, I talk about return on investment quite a lot when it comes to things like L and D teams and HR teams. Um, and I think you hit the nail on the head there that when you talk about things like 4% attrition, it's just a number. It's just like 75% thought that training course was wonderful. We had 2000 people pass through that e-learning last week. Oh, that's amazing compared to what? I don't know. I don't know whether that's good, bad. If it was an awful e-learning, it's actually a bad thing that 2000 people went through that. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. doesn't matter. But then when you suddenly go, well, hang on a minute, did you know that 2000 people going through an e-learning that lasted an hour cost this? Did you know that 4% attrition or 25% attrition in six months costs this? And that's, you, as you quite rightly say, because then the money side of it, actually does come around into the, the the actual targets and the measurables of the business it's something that's an oh my god i never really thought of it like this and and the one thing that there's a phrase that kind of that, that makes my skin crawl a little bit when when talking about these things is that um if we if i suggest something like well we need to consider the, uh, the the people's time that are doing that training we need to consider the manager's time for um consulting and being a stakeholder for that all that sort of stuff uh, and my time for consulting with you because i'm a business partner or an lnd manager well the response tends to be we well they're kind of sunken costs because we'd be paying that whether you're doing that or not because that's the salary that... well yeah you I get it but right at this moment you are paying that portion of that salary for that and you will tell me quite often that you know that the head of or the the senior leader the and the people on the front line they can't have an hour away from the phones or an hour away from their jobs 
because of the opportunity cost. They can't have that time for the coaching. But then we do the training and we seem to forget about the fact that how many stakeholder meetings are there? How many stakeholder meetings actually revolve around that project where we're reviewing design, we're signing off design, we're making tweaks. We're looking at it again. We've then got 6,000 people off the phones at various points in time, all doing this training. I mean, just think about it for a second. The average, and if any sort of big corps are out there, thinking of the number of people who come in on inductions and just think how much is their salary per week? And then think about how many weeks your induction is. I just think, well, that, that's the cost of the induction. That, it isn't how long did it take to build. That isn't the cost of the induction. Yeah. Training people that yeah. way is, is that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and so it isn't a sunken cost. It's, everything has an actual cost. What people yeah. aren't doing is taking the time to break it out um, and modernising that. Process. And that's why I did the, the sort of A to B exercise, because, again, it's the reality check of well, we'll do six within there. So we've got an average uh, what it came out as. And say, so every time we go, yep, yeah, we need another person. Let's remember mm. that person's worth. The moment you say that, mm. value is this. Um, and, and so um, is it right? Are we doing it right? Are, are we mitigating any risks? Are we being mindful? Um, and I also to people, I always work that if it's my own money, because it's yeah. so easy. I see so many people make... Um, I'm going to say questionable decisions, my polite version, are yeah. on, on business decisions because they know that it's not their cash. Yeah. Uh, they've got a bit of a safety net. They've got a bit of a trampoline if it doesn't quite go right. And they'll always blame someone else if it doesn't anyway, yeah. uh, which obviously, again, goes against everything I believe in. But, but the same way is that happens as reality. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's easy to spend other people's cash and say, OK, well, well, we believe this is the right thing to do. This is the tick box thing to do. I can go in a meeting and say, oh, yeah, I've got all of my team now fully trained, so they, they should be great. Um, and it's someone else's cash that you're burning. So um, they will go, well, you know, yeah, but they haven't stopped to consider the effectiveness of the learning, um, how they're going to prove that learning's being plowed back into the, you know, the, the environment, what they're going to see, when they're going to see it, mm. how they're going to, you know, people talk about return on investment. It's like, well, they very very few people actually able to manage that um as in understand mm. how to actually show that measurement um yeah. and, and there are, you know there are areas that it's very difficult to and i get with people it is not not everything is that tangible not everything in hr is is always 100 percent tangible um but again it's about where it's not tangible so again still have that conversation mm. what is it how if it's not something that we'll physically see how will we observe it maybe it's a, a behavior change um maybe it's about how they conduct themselves in a meeting it might just be something very subtle but the impact of that something subtle will be really really powerful yeah. in terms of leadership um, it's, again it's impact again because I, I, i'm yeah. a big believer in the fact that if you do the stuff and i'm talking about lnd as well as hr again here if you do the stuff that you think proves you're doing something and you present that to a ceo and a senior suite of leaders then they probably won't care about them because it's not something that, that they've come up with that they care about it, like bums on seats e-learnings courses on lms's all those sort of things what yeah. i want to do is i want to actually do the things that make those senior leaders go oh my god we couldn't have done this without you yes and we can't measure to the nth degree what your contribution was exactly yeah. but God, I know that you contributed to that and we cannot risk losing you in the next round of whatever restructures and, and things that we do in that elk. I mean, I, I love your, your point about spending money of your own because uh, I, I normally ask, I ask that question as well. Uh, but I also ask the question, um, imagine if it was the customers because I have worked at companies like Sky and at Talk Talk and places like that. Um, and uh, I always give a little shout out to my mum when I do this story. Like, imagine my, my dear old mum there watching watching Sky Plus and paying her subscription and thinking, oh, the prices have gone up and all this sort of stuff. We could say, well, you know, if we were to go back to Jean there and tell her that uh, all of her yearly subscription has gone on you doing this or us doing that or whatever it might be, would do, do you be comfortable telling the customer that? And, and quite often it's, oh, God, no, I wouldn't tell them that because we get shouted at. That's not the right way. Well, should we be spending it that way then? Yeah, yeah, it comes back to that transparency stuff, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, and that sort of internal and external. Um, and again, I, I genuinely believe there's so many people um, have forgotten how important leadership is in terms of they see themselves as the leader in the business because they're of their seniority rather than 
being a leader of any sense, anybody who's responsible for another human being within an organisation, even if it's just one person, um, you know, it's about that role modelling. It's about coming to work every day to make a difference and a positive impact. Um, Recognising, like you say, that that self-awareness piece is so critical because when you say, actually, do you know what? I'm having a really tough day today, so therefore I'm actually probably not at my best and I'm going to be a bit, bit barky or a bit, bit, you know, a bit short with people today. And um, one of my clients is such a great guy because I respect him immensely because he will say, openly and honestly say, I'm having a tough day today. I'm not at my best. I need to get this done. But please forgive me if I come across as a little bit arsy. It's not intended at you. I'm just under it right now. Yeah. And that I can fully get behind. And the next day I'll say, yeah, today's better. And, and actually, you know, thanks for bearing with it. What I, He could say anything to me. He could shout and swear it wouldn't offend me. The fact that he has said, it doesn't negate him being rude because he's not rude. Mm. Um, that's a whole different leader altogether um, and not a very good one. Um, but, but again, self-aware knows where he is in terms of his day. He is a human. We're going to have good days. We're going to have bad days. And that's the whole point is actually supporting, regardless of, of what their title is, regardless if it's the cleaner or the CEO, it makes no difference. That person's having a tough day. Just take a moment and say, how are you doing today? And actually, is there something I can do to help your day get better? Because yeah. if it is, and I can, uh, then let me do it. Let me support you. Um, because like I say, the higher you go, the more responsibility you have. Yeah, There's a lot to do, especially now people are really, really feeling it. Um, and not forgetting they've gone through their own emotional journey of the last 12 months, just because they've been a CEO of a business that hasn't been impacted negatively or has been impacted. They're still gone through the worry of themselves, their families, uh, their children, any, anything like that. So let's remember they are human beings um, and yes, they are the captain of the ship, but it doesn't stop them having all the day-to-day worries that we have, mm. all the day-to-day emotions that we have. They don't stop being humans because they are the CEO. If anything else, they're, they're in charge of a big budget, you know, 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people. And while they have people underneath them, the buck stops with them. Yeah. The shareholders are, are, are you know, leaning into them when things aren't right. They're the ones that take the heat. And, and I was always told, um, I remember saying to a previous boss before, oh, it must be tough at the top. Yeah. Um, and uh, and giggling because you see some days where, where he would really feel it. And um, and his, his response he made me laugh. And, uh, and he said, yes, Lisa, it does. He said, it is. He said, but always remember this, my lovely. He said, shit flows downhill too. <laughs> it just <laughs> made me laugh because that's the way you could see. It's like, well, well, if I'm feeling it, then everyone else is going to feel it. But that's the whole yeah, point yeah. of him. He took his role seriously as a leader and said, well, I have to try and stop that from happening. Yeah. Um, but absolutely. again, that's that's a rare breed where you have somebody who, who you know, is responsible for a huge business, but also very, very people centric. It's a, it's, a, it's a key point you can talk about. I, I, I use the question sometimes in groups around almost like a, a devil's advocacy way of playing, because what tends to happen, especially again in the kind of more bigger, larger corporations where you don't tend to see the people at the top as much for obvious reasons, um, it can be dead easy to kind of go, oh, Lisa, he's done that again, or oh, Rob, oh, Rob, yeah, yeah, you've seen her, she's oh, unbelievable, yeah, what a pain, they're making a right mess of leading this, aren't they? And I say, for a moment, just imagine this was a court of law, play devil's advocate, and you were you were, you were, were the lawyer for the, for the um, defendant here. What would you say, rather than jumping on, you couldn't jump on and agree that this person is making a pig's ear of all this, what would you do to defend them? What, what would be your case? Um, and some of the things you're talking there, which is why it's reminded me, those are the tends to be the things that come out well. It's it's high pressure. The, the book stops with them. They've got to answer to the stakeholders. Um, everyone looks at them for answers when they go and gets tough and all that. Oh, wow. Okay. So now now you're starting to think what it's like to be in their shoes for a day. Yeah. Now think about what you were just complaining about. <laughs> and yeah, and start putting those so- two things together. You've been a bit harsh. You think it's fair. Uh, and again, but even if you think somebody's not doing a great job, of it, it's that, you know, building a relationship where you can say, Lisa, you are doing my head in today. <laughs> yeah. What is up with you? Because this is not like you. And actually, you're just barking orders. Not that I'm like that, because I'm very, very purposefully not. But, uh, but as an example, um, uh, but, you know, being able to have a relationship to say, how can I make your day easier? How can I take, if I can take one thing off you today, what would that one thing be? Yeah. Just so that you've got 20 minutes just to have a coffee and breathe or actually stop in a meeting or stop in some training and say, actually, do you know what? The best thing for us to all do right now 
is just to take take yourself off and go and have a 15 minute walk yeah whatever is going on here this isn't working and it's actually affecting the rest of the room so respectfully go go take 15 minutes and go walk it off and come back yeah. and i and i've done that in a number of, of very sort of senior meetings where i've said um i stood up and i've got on behalf of everyone in the room who has clearly got it written all over their face, but they haven't got the confidence to say, I am going to say what needs to be said. Mm. We need to have a break. Uh, you know, project meetings, I get sometimes can be very, very heated debates because you've got you know, numbers, you've got some large sums of money, you've got deadlines, you've got lots of stakeholders, you've got right hand not know what the left hand's doing, all of that. And they, they tend to get very full on. Um, and that's what I'm saying. I'll say, so let's just stop. Let's just stop. And, you know, there's two or three in the room that are really, really animated to the point where um, it's destructive rather mm. than constructive. I will stand up and say, this is what we do. But I always frame it. See, the thing as I do is I will, when I do any kind of um, leadership training or anything, any meetings, that's the, one of the first things I'll say. When people go around the room and they introduce themselves and they're from different um, companies, et cetera, um, I will say, uh, I just want to make you aware that um, I've taken it upon myself to almost be mediator in the room by default. And what that means is this, and I frame it up and I say to people what we're doing, and I say to people, it gets to the point, um, I will call it, and I will ask people just to go say, take 10, go for a comfort break, um, or whatever it may be. But if it gets to the point where we're not making any progress and we're not making any sense, and it's just only up tit for tat and, and almost, you know, not quite name calling, but you know what I mean? It's just yeah, one yeah. person's trying to outshout the other. We're not getting anywhere. Then mm. I will ask the hotheads to go and leave the room. Now they can leave the room or they can stay. That is their choice. Mm. But if I get to that point, it means we failed in the room as, as a, you know, a bunch of grown-ups. We've got beyond the point of being reasonable and we're actually mm. being petty yeah. um, and immature. And actually that's not good leadership. We're here as leaders. So remember the position and hold that line mm. is we are all in leadership positions what we do, what we say, and perhaps others. So let's role model that. Let's remember our position. Let's remember it is a privilege to be here. Mm. Um, and we don't get people? to bash each other over the head. Um, and sometimes it goes well and people say, yeah, that's great. And sometimes I, I take the heat back or somebody say, oh, I am. F off, who do you think you are, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and, and that's all good too, because I say, okay, right, direct at me, keep going. And yeah. then I will purposely say things again. So they'll just go, <laughs> and then afterwards I say, do you feel better now? And on occasions we'll have, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, are we going to crack on? Yeah. yeah, okay, good. Otherwise, I'll say, actually, you've completely lost the plot and I'm closing the meeting. And without me, you can't have it. I'm done. Good night. I'll see you tomorrow. Clever head. And, and I'll, but I will lead the room or break it up if need be when it gets to that point. Because um, I see that as, again, is mm. I'm empowering myself to do that mm. um, because that shouldn't, that's not right for people to be almost bullied in a meeting. Yeah. Um, because somebody's more senior than the other or outshouted because of the other. Hmm. Um, I, I wonder yeah. I wonder how many people, uh, how many uh, kind of senior HR leaders and L&D leaders who, you know, quite often talk about needing that seat at the top table to, to influence these things, listen to that and go, well, I, I, there's a difference between being at the table and observing and getting stuff and actually doing that sort of stuff i wouldn't i wouldn't do that because i wouldn't want to i wouldn't want to incur that wrath um but what i'm actually seeing is that you know you're, you're talking about not just being at that top table but actually act as all the rest are in actually belonging at that top table table and and hold people accountable for the roles that they've got yeah it's about behaviors and again when people get um animated they they get frustrated um you know it comes out in all different things so again change the context you're going to change behavior you mm. may see behaviors around it around a meeting that you've not seen before or actually just they are too full-on and people have forgotten where they're at they're at work they're still professional they're still boundaries mm. um and so you know you've got a number of variables so like i say some people say oh my god i never do that so career limiting mm. um yeah it, you know again it depends on the environment but the reason why I open with that in the meeting is that people are aware of it. It's not a surprise. Mm. And actually, I get an awful lot of encouragement. Actually, do you know what? That's probably a good thing. Yeah. Um, and um, and I say, and so if somebody does just lose it, it's like, okay. Um, and I have been said before, again, I have said I'm a, I'm a strong female and I'm proud of that fact, mm. is when somebody has gone sort of full vocal, you know, barrage of everything, I've gone and said, do you feel big now? You tried to make me feel small. And instantly, everyone else in the room looks at the feet going, oh, my God, this is so awful. And it's cringeworthy. But I guarantee you, at that point, they go, sit down, 
Now be quiet and say, okay, let's remember why we're here in the room. This is why we're here in the room. This is, you know, the, you know, the, the thing we're trying to solve or the problem or, or discussion. So let's just take a five minute comfort break and let's get back to agenda point seven, shall we? Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And that person has said a few times that that's happened, don't like doing it, but if I, if I feel the need to do it or if I feel that somebody else has almost been bullied in the room, um, I will do that too. Um, yeah. Because as a leader, I see it's fair and right to make other person self-aware um, where they have failed to do it themselves. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's admirable as well. I think one of the things you say on, on LinkedIn is that you, you won't put the, I think you said it in this podcast as well, actually, that putting the human back into HR. Um, so what would be quite useful is a kind of what's what's led to that point. If we kind of take a, a bit of a tour, if we can, of, of, of your experience and your, and, your, and your background to kind of explain maybe what it is that's made you come to this point and start thinking in this way and wanting to lead in this way um that'd be really good for me to hear and i guess the listeners to understand that yeah uh, again i've uh, been in hr for 30 years always stayed in this sme startup scale of businesses i like yeah. um one day you'll be doing one thing and next hour up something completely different um i appreciate that like say in in the the world of hr there's lots of different um um i call them genres but uh, lots of different <laughs> specializations um of um and again the l d piece is, is always interesting to me because again it's seen as by many as a branch off of hr mm. rather than a specialization in its own right uh, i'm sure you've got plenty to say about that one um but but yeah Just so i, I <laughs> yeah. um but that's why you don't see lots of l d directors there's, there are very few uh, unless they're huge big corporate companies where you'll see lots of HR directors because they encompass recruitment, uh, reward, L&D, all, all of the, the moving parts. So, um, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I've always been in the industry in that way. Um, I've worked in lots of sort of standalone roles. So where I don't know it, I've had to go and learn it. Yeah. So I'm very self-sufficient. Um, again, the mentors that I have engaged with have always been strong females. Uh, one of my first mentors had said to me, uh, two things. She said that I would have to work twice as hard for half the privileges of my male counterparts. And obviously yeah. that was 25 years ago and she wasn't wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so again, as, as a female sort of going into leadership roles and, and being taken seriously by the board, uh, it has been, you know, there's, there's lots of learnings. There were some wins and there were some, some huge losses uh, along the way as part of, okay, what could I have done differently? Yeah, I'm not being taken seriously. Um, actually, what I've got to say is important. So how should they get to listen? And it all came back to one one skill, if I could put it down to one point, is the power to influence. Mm -hmm. And that um, I learned very early in my career. Um, and then that's always stayed with me. And I speak to people about that a lot of the time. Because like most people, you have your level of expertise. If you have a team, you don't need to know every single thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but you need to be aware of what's going on. Um, it's like I'm not an employment lawyer, but I know enough about employment law to give good advice but I'm not a solicitor. Mm. Um, and lots of people, you know, expect you to be in HR and be uh, a solicitor and a, a coach and a counsellor um, and, uh, you know, all, all of the different hats. Um, so it's about, underst I understood about knowing enough about it, making mm. sure I've got great people who were um, hungry to learn um, mm. and, were, you know, whether they had experience or not was irrelevant to me. Mm. If they had the right attitude to learn, it's like, okay, well, I can teach um, and I'll show you what you need to do and everything like that. And again, that breeds loyalty and, and getting the right people on board. Um, I've always pushed myself to continually learn mm. you know, the latest thinking. Um, and so my, my, you know, one of my first mentors always said, Lisa, you'll also encourage people that will throw stones, um, take them and build an empire and stand on the top and look down at them when they think oh, you that. couldn't do it or you wouldn't do it or you couldn't. So if somebody says to me, I can't, I'll go, really? Okay, we'll watch it. I'll do it. Um, I'm just very, very driven that way. I know not everybody is, um, but I'm very sort of self-sustainable in that way. So if they say I can't, I'll, I will do it with bells and whistles on or I will almost break myself to do it. Um, and I empower a lot of people. Um, and that's why I like LinkedIn because I, it's a lot of things that I write that come from the heart that makes sense for a lot of people. They resonate with the audience. Mm. And I have literally thousands of messages a week with people saying, thank you so much. You said it. Um, mm. I've been thinking about that. I've been worried about that. That's really good information. That's really good help. Um, and I love that. I think that's really, really important. Again, it's my position within a senior person in HR mm. to be able to gift back to people who are just out the, you know, just out of the university or, or in, a, in a role they're struggling to kind of get out of or 
Um, mm. You know, don't think because we work in HR that there aren't some dark stories of bullying and manipulation within their own teams, yeah. um, because there are. And so, again, how to handle those sorts of things while coming through your career. Yeah. Um, and so, you have got a follower on there. I think it's 20, 27, 28,000 followers on LinkedIn, I, I think it's have no idea um I, I don't i don't keep track of the numbers i just know that uh, my my when i pass you know post something i get good engagement and then my, yeah. my dms follow but uh, it's a privilege to be in a position where i can help mm. people um with with the small things but you know it gets ever harder with um mm. you know trying to find the time to do it and i would love to help everybody and can't but mm. um but again it just comes back to it's who i am um it's the way i've always been i always think about rather than, you know, like things like disciplinaries and grievances, it's like, well, rather than be judged during execution here, that's not my role. Yeah. My role is to listen with yeah. both ears, not judgment, listen, open-minded, listen to the facts and then say, okay, what's the best way out of all of this mess yeah. for both parties? And it's about that fairness. It's about being equitable. Yeah. Um, sometimes I say to the employer, well, actually, you know what? We did them a disservice because we didn't do what we said we were going to do. Yeah. We let them down too. So actually, where do we go with this? And then we've obviously had some senior ones, which, you know, in the court case and everything else like that. But I'd like to give people the opportunity to, mm. to think about what they've done, the opportunity, a second chance, you know, if it's not too serious. Um, we are humans. We make mistakes. We sometimes we do dumb things. Mm. Um, should it be career defining? Well, if it's not that serious, then no. I'd rather have a car park conversation. Say to me, "What are you doing? Come on, mm. you're better than this. Let's let's talk about it and let's yeah. find a way forward." Um, and so, of course, as as a young person sort of coming into HR, one of my mentors that's the way that she sort of taught me and explained and expressed to me how she dealt with people and why she dealt them that way. Um, and she was an inspiration and so um, I kind of carried that on but it it makes more sense I get at some point it was almost uh, ahead of what people were thinking because yeah. HR has very been process driven um, very sort of we do it this way and the book says that and we do it that way and lots of people are taught that and I've always gone against that and said okay well let's put human emotion into the mix let's look at that factor then we'll, we'll put that with a the context. Then we'll put that with what they have to do with the process. And then what we'll have is a good, solid um, end result with taking all of those variables. and can, So I don't just make a quick decision and go, yeah, it's this and let's do that. Um, you're dealing with people. You know, nobody comes to work to do a bad job. So if they're doing a bad job, that's why ask them why. Yeah. Nobody's going to risk their mortgage. Nobody's going to risk their children's meals on their table knowingly. Yeah. Um, so there's usually a reason why. So I always go back and say, well, what's their why? Mm. What's going on in their world that has changed them to be able to behave like this and not care or actually behave like this and they're just um, or, or they're not turning up at work. Mm. You know, the amount of people we spend time with in the meetings, I say, oh, it's about absence. OK, they're late every day. Have you asked them why? What? And they're, yeah, but they've got to be here. So, yeah, but if we just stop and ask them why? Oh, OK. Mm. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it'll be because. They've just had a marriage split up and they're the only person yeah. taking their children to school now. Um, and they didn't talk to anybody about it because they didn't think they could. Mm. Um, and they just thought well, it was a short term thing while they got some childcare in place. Trust, trust and, actually, and vulnerability again. It's the, yeah, absolutely. The, about the Teams generation now where we're going to go, in, oh, well, have you seen they've, they've, they've not had the little green dot on Teams for the last two hours? They've been away. What are they doing? They should be working. Ask. Yeah. Ask the question, like you say, Have emergency at school, just, the, the school yeah. rang, the kid was ill, I had to go to the doctor, could be anything. I mean, I, I love the way that you talk about that that kind of role, because I, in that sort of L&D world, very similarly, I, I, I say that quite often the, the business, if we allow them, want us to play their own role of a pharmacist that we've got all these things on the shelf and some of them you can walk in and just pick up and pay for. There you go. There's the kind of self-directed learning, brilliant stuff. Great. Self-medicated. Sometimes you go to the till and you say, I want something for this. And they'll go, you can have this or this, boom. There you go. But there's no consultation involved. Whereas I think we need to move on to become what I call uh, a performance GP. I don't know the doctor is that I want it specifically to be the GP because that GP is able to listen to what are the things that are going on, not jump to the conclusion that you think it is, actually objectively trying to figure out what it is that's actually going on, but also is willing to stand back and say, this isn't my area of expertise. What I'm going to need to do is refer you to a specialist in this or a specialist in that or a specialist in the other. But equally, sometimes they might just write a prescription for you to go back to the pharmacy <laughs> and get something that was there. 
well, at least that conversation has happened. And uh, I mean, does that does that resonate for you in, when we talk about that? Yeah, well, massively. So it's a good analogy, uh, for sure. But like I say, it's, you know, and so rather than being process driven and, and the book, the handbook, the dreaded bloody handbook that yeah. says this, um, again, you're dealing with human beings and, mm. you know, it's about having real conversations with people. Um, and even if, you know, you have a, a large business and you've got a shared services model of HR where you never meet anybody from HR and they are that person that you, if you have to ring them and something's probably gone quite wrong. Um, and again, when I speak to people in that environment very recently, I said, what's it been like for you guys? And they're like, well, it's not, not having any change. You know, again, a bit like uh, it's a call center. Hello, what's the problem? Oh, OK, you've got a problem with your manager. Right. OK. And you want to do this and want to bring a grievance. OK, right. Well, I'll send you that form. And you have to send it to so and so. Right. Anything else? No, great. That's fine. Um, and that is like. Are we really on the time? Are we really on the clock on that? Would you want to sort of say, okay, so so what's happened? And then, okay, and how else would you like, before we go all formal, you know, mm. can we arrange an informal conversation? Would you like someone else to be in the room with you so that you've got that mediation? Do you think we could sort this out informally? Do you think we could, because there's more conversations going to happen um, with a better outcome by being, you know, being having a conversation. Mm. rather than here's the process and off we go. And so I've never been like that, even from the very beginning. Mm. Um, and working as small and agile businesses, um, I've, I've been, some days have been great, some days we've been running around like a head on fire, some days have been very nice and done all the really good stuff, like apprentice programs. And some days it's been, oh my God, you know, you've really felt it because you've had to do, you know, large scale recruit uh, redundancies, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and through all of that, again, is that resilience, that mental resilience that you have to have in HR. Yeah. Um, I believe that you have to have a great sense of humor because if you don't, you're not going to survive. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then, so that, that's the sort of three things, which, which was the, you know, you have a voice, so use it, use it professionally, but use it, help guide others who, yeah. who don't even know they need some guidance, mm. um, you know, get involved, ask some questions, be curious. Um, and yeah, you know, challenge where, you know, you've got yeah. to be able to ask the question back is that the right thing to do as a business? Should we be doing this? And it's not because you want to um, add conflict into the room. But it's because you want to instigate that conversation that says, maybe we could do it better. Yeah. And if so, what could that look like? And like you say with the GP, it might not be. They might say, actually, we've, we've talked about it and actually we're still in the same conclusion. But there'll be other things that have come from that conversation that have added value to other people's perspectives, how, the, how they've heard it, how they then go, go back and you know address that with their teams and things. Yeah. Um, I think more conversations that happen, the more our learning grows. Yeah, as individuals. And, that's the, and that's the world of stakeholders for you. You know, sometimes you think about the GP and stakeholders, kind of compare them and kind of go. Well, some stakeholders come to me and they and they get it more. They know that training might not be the answer, and they, and they know that something else is at play, and they and they get it cool yeah. and other ones will just come and they don't think in that way and they just want the pill to make it all better <laughs> whichever way yeah. it might be just just yeah. make and i think that's a great ones. one actually because i think for some people hr is that pill mm. we are the red pill or we're the blue pill yeah um and depending on what they want it's like well there's there's a prescriptive outcome so yeah. we we don't think this person fits anymore for whatever reason so want them want them gone i i, I hear conversations like that all the time and I say well hang on just just stop yeah what do you mean you want them gone? What, what was the reason? What's led to that? Because that's a harsh decision. Yeah. And you've already decided what the outcome is without actually looking at, at the other variables. Mm. Um, I, and I hear that all the time. Yeah, yeah, I don't think they're right for us now. They just want them gone. Like the, yeah. the, another human being, another person with flesh and blood is no longer good enough for them. Well, um, yeah. I'm sorry, but but I don't, I don't think it's acceptable to treat people like that, to speak about people like that. Mm. Um, it may not be that the skills no longer fit the environment or no longer fit the business. Mm. I'll accept that. Mm. But again, just from that very kind of, um, I don't know, disrespectful way that you're speaking about another person, um, mm. it appalls me. Um, and then some people say that I'm naive and, and, you know, that happens all the time. And I get it. I, I you know, I've seen some horror stories as, as we've gone along. Um, but my role as a leader, wherever I've gone, regardless of what my title has been, I see leadership is if you can see something that you can add value to, to help, then yeah. that's, you know, that's, that's a key part of, of leadership. Of Just to help ground sometimes, help ground people. One of the, one of the, mm. probably one of the questions I ask the most is the simplest question. Um, and you can add your own sort of context to it, but it tends to be, have you actually just spoken to them? 
have you asked them? Um, you know, one of my, my favourite examples, and obviously no names, but the, there was a, a leader I was coaching once who had someone in the team who had a, a physical disability and was probably was quite conscious about that disability, um, but actually was uh, underperforming in, in their role. And the leader had then caught wind that there was actually a, a, another disability, more of an invisible disability in addition to that. But obviously didn't feel like she could bring it up with the person because because she didn't officially know it um but the problem was there was still a lack of performance so i'm gonna to have to performance manage this so again just starting with have you spoken to her you don't have to reveal that you know something necessarily um but just hold on for a second you know mm-hmm. how how why do you think that she's confided into that someone else in the organization and not you yeah. Let's explore that for a moment. And that's not a criticism. That's not slinging mud. What, 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 what's actually, I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong. What's made her though, confide in somebody and what's made her confide in anybody. Why she felt the need to tell someone in the organization, probably because it's uh, she, she thinks this is impacting something at work as well. Um, and really delve into that side of it. If you could put yourself in her shoes for an half an hour, and then we got to the kind of conclusion going, oh, my God, though, well, you know, she's probably thinking that she's got the physical disability and that's already been potentially monitored and making a standout. If she reveals this other one, God, she might think she's going to be under the microscope about performance. Oh, imagine how terrible that would feel then. Oh, God, I'd hate that. Right. Yeah. So why do you think she's not mentioned it? <laughs> yeah, and again, so much is solved from a good conversation. Yeah. Um, bear with me, Rob. I am going to have to just plug in because it's flashing to say my battery is no, no worries. Like I said, real things happen in real time. Absolutely. Not a problem at all. I made sure my phone was off, but I didn't plug in. <laughs> nah, these things always happen. It's not a problem whatsoever. That's it. There we go. Back on. There we go. Got you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, so, like we're saying, just being able to go and and like put yourself in their shoes for a second, yeah, and just ask the question. You don't have to go. Oh, I've heard this rumor. Just kind of go. I've noticed. I've noticed that you don't seem to be on your best form at the minute. Talk to me. What's going on? And not in the office in front of people. Go for a coffee. All those things that we talk about. Go for a walk. Uh, and even in this modern current still covid maybe hopefully soon post covid world yeah it's not as easy to do that around the office at the moment potentially still but you can still go for a walk both of you go for walks you're on the phone you don't have to be doing a zoom meeting you don't have to be all official just take out the out the environment for a second Uh, and if it's possible and if you are local meet up and do your kind of socially distanced walk you can even go into a beer garden now (laughs) what i'm um, also interested you've mentioned you've mentioned a few times as well about you being the strong female and you've mentioned that that maybe working twice as hard was the advice that you got mm. there maybe for half as much a return um i guess there's two two questions i've got about that is that one have you seen that's changed or evolved throughout your career has it always been just as difficult or has it become easier or worse or peaks and troughs uh, and is that and is that both in terms of the hr profession and as a leader or one more than the other uh, it's quite interesting, actually, because, you know, generally as a whole, um, you know, more women go into HR. Mm-hmm. OK. Um, and what's interesting in is more women start off their career in HR, go into HR up to middle management. And then when it starts to get to uh, HR director level, yeah. there's more um, males than females in director roles. OK. 
okay, in, in one particular sector is actually. Um, so there's a higher proportion, um, and you've also got a higher proportion of people who will work in management roles and then go from a senior management role into a HR director role who's never worked in HR yeah. as a male than as a female. Because, uh, again, so I don't know the correlation or the stats on that, but I've seen that an awful lot spoken to a number of people who have you know, who have coached and also said, well, hang on a minute, I've worked for that company for 15 years, a HR DJ will come up, and the head of HR... And then so and so, Bob from, from operations has come in and snaffled it. How the hell do I come back from that? Why? I don't understand. You know? And so we have, you know, so I'm talking from, from the real experiences that people have had as well. Um, so I do, you know, generally it's a, HR is a very female dominated industry, mm-hmm. but when it comes to the senior roles, um, it's it's not a given uh, that you will you will you will get it just because you've been in the industry for a number of years. So I still think of the senior roles. Um, Although there's a high proportion of women, um, it's it's more balanced in terms of sort of people coming through the ranks. Um, so I, again, but there's probably a whole topic we could talk about in terms of that, but um, but we won't do today. Um, but in terms of how I found it, I um, I'd like to say we've got better. I, I like to say that um, in terms of understanding of um, again the uh, benefits of having any kind of um, you know diversity on any board or any leadership team is about the diversity of thinking and the challenging and that's what comes from and that's it, the true benefit um but i still see just even as a female let alone anything else um that there's still an awful lot way to go to be taken seriously because and i i spoke to somebody only two weeks ago you'll, you'll be horrified at this but again the fact that you know we are in 2021 and there are still conversations happening about this. Whereas I had a, a colleague who had um, been a uh, senior HRD, had, uh, sorry, head of HR, had gone on maternity leave for a year, came back. There was obviously then a HRD role advertised. She applied for it and one other did who hadn't worked in HR. Um, and uh, the guy got the role and she said, why, why did he get the role? I've been you know, with you guys, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the feedback, although it was unofficial and said that, that you know, um, actually, um, and this is what their, their, you know, CEO had turned around and said, well, well, respectfully, well, we can't exactly put you into a, um, a promotion. You've just had 12 months off. Wow. Um, and so she was like, what I, I you know, the fact that you come out and said it was just like, yeah. Um, but but again, so she'd been punished and penalised for having twelve months off to have a baby, uh, which is a right and a no offence. If women stop having babies, then you know the world is going to turn anyway. But anyway, yeah. Um, but yeah, so she she was told that she wouldn't be taken to that because she'd had a year off. But we're still allowed so, to. But still, I mean, and not that she shouldn't have been allowed, but we're still allowed to apply, and was interviewed. Yes. But then was given a reason why she couldn't have the job that would have been equally as valid or invalid to say you can't apply, or you can't have an interview because we're not going to give you the job. So there's no point in applying. Yeah, <laughs> so- yeah. yeah, yeah. And so like I say, so wow. yeah, but the, but the fact of the matter is that's that's what she was told, uh, you know, unofficially that, yeah. that, yeah, we couldn't because, you know, um, you know, how, how could it, how could that be? Because she just had 12 months off. So Although I'd like to say in areas we are getting better, I still think we've got an awful long way to go that, yes, you know, said person has been off for 12 months to have a baby. Yeah. And you are a parent, uh, prop, and you know how hard it is to juggle. It is. Uh, you know, and, and you actually gain other skills when you have, you know, children that you didn't have before. Patience being one of them, you, you know, you, you learn that as a whole new level of skill yeah. um, and, and juggling things and dealing with stress and, and all of those sorts of things. So, but the fact of the matter is she had her skills when she left. She hasn't lost her skills because she's been off having a baby. No. Um, and she had also still continued to do lots of CPD stuff in between whilst, whilst you know, mm. uh, often that year. So she's still, you know, purposely focused on coming back for a good career, yeah. etc. Well, absolutely. It's not all oh, walking the, in the park and Costa Coffees. It's, it's, a, it's a hard oh, job no, no, having yeah. kids. Oh, absolutely. But like I said, but the fact that, that, yeah, so she didn't get the promotion because wow. she had a baby. So, um and of course, that would never have happened. That would have never been part of the discussion had that been a guy. Yeah. Uh, but again, the same way as, as you know, very few guys would take a year off, um, you know, in terms of parental care, uh, yeah. because predominantly, again, whether we like it or not, 
they're usually the, the main bread earners in many areas. Yeah. Um, and so they can't afford to take the time off, which again, you know, personally I disagree with it should be that financially either party can afford to be off to have time with their children. We're, yeah. you know, but I can't fix that that hole of, of it's kind of interesting but, actually. I don't know if you watch if you ever listen or read anything from uh, Jordan Peterson, the Canadian um um university lecturer but kind of clinical psychologist as well um he's got some really interesting views around this sort of stuff and and he's he's fascinating to watch whether you you like him or not and he's what again you mentioned the term earlier he's a little bit marmite um but he'll he'll talk about this and he'll say that his point of view by the way um that um that that women have been missold the career dream in many respects that uh, as a as a as a culture what we what we used to do is that women would have babies earlier on in their lives and career yeah. and then could make the choice probably by the time they were 30 mid 30s to then double down and focus on that career because the kids have grown up um whereas what's happened now is from a from a school age um young girls are actually made to think more about their careers and told them that they deserve a career and they shouldn't have to just be at home and equality and all this sort of great stuff that, you know, has got a really positive intent behind it. Well, that then does is it it postpones. And I think, you know, the stats, if if I looked them up, I've heard things in the past that kind of do back it up to say that people are leaving it longer to start families now. And there's a number of influencing factors in there. Mm. But the fact that you do that is that you've you've kind of, at that point, you've, you've built a career by the time you're in your mid thirties, you're actually doing really yeah. successfully and then having to break away from it. Uh, and at which yeah. point people then have that conflict of, well, do, do I need to, do, should I be spending the time at home? Should I stay in my career? Um, is this the right thing to do? Am I going to get bypassed? It's interesting. It's interesting thought that, you know, if we, we've put yeah. that c- pressure on people and, and women in particular now to have careers more than we've ever done. But at the same time, then that leads to a, a really difficult choice and a conflict later around in the career. Do you, do, have you found that yourself from people that you talk to? Yeah. And again, there's that still that whole stigma about when people work part time. Yeah. yeah. You know, when people work part time uh, around school hours or anything like that, they uh, again, I've seen so many people um, over past promotions or not quite. You know, they've lost the gravitas of the room because they'll she's only part time. Like, yeah. again, it, like it's a it's a dirty little stain of a well, she's part time. So therefore, she's not very good. It's that word you mentioned then. She's the only part time. Yeah. And again, so it comes back to language. Yeah. Because that's that's exactly what they say. Oh, she's only part time. Yeah. Um, and what and, would you um, do if it surprised you if I told you that that person who's only part time does more in three days than you do yeah. in your five days? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And ain't that the truth? Uh, but yeah, but again, it, language is an awful lot um, of, yeah. of um, so, so damaging. Um, and I actually, and while I'm, I don't sound like I'm, I'm man bashing you because I'm, I'm not, it's a genuine, it's a very interesting topic. And, and I say, we've yeah. still got, you know, a long way to go to be treated as an equal, to be paid as an equal, to be respected as an equal. Yeah. So we've made some good strides, uh, but but we've, you know, we've still got a long way to go, I truly believe. But that said, I've also found the same diversity from females. So yeah. as a person who I've worked full time for my children's so, from when they were little, um, I was the the main earner. So we you yeah. have you know traditional sense. I I was, was the main earner in my household. So I would be the one who would drop the kids off in the morning. Um, I would stay to the little assemblies and things um, unless it was a special one, in which case I'd, I'd flex. But again, years ago you didn't have the flexibility. You were either yeah. at work and you killed yourself or something else a week. Otherwise, you <laughs> won't work anything. She's not committed, and that still happens, which is awful. Yeah. But but not so much now. But um, so that was the thing. Um, and my husband would pick them up. Um, at Etc. Cetera, et cetera. And he would be home in the afternoons um, and be their main carer um, and make yeah. dinner and things like that. And I would have whispers um, in the playground from other mums who were working uh, either part time or, or not at all. They were, you know, their, their husband were, were paying the bills. Um, and they'd be, oh, she's nice to stay for this one, has she? Or, um, oh, um, you know, dressing up. I didn't have time to go and hand sew a. I yeah, have uh, a Viking outfit. Mine would be on Amazon or, or you know, yeah. friend would have, yeah. You know, my cakes weren't homemade. They were M&S, taking out the packet, put on the plate. Everybody knew it, it was a going joke. Um, but because I couldn't be everywhere and do everything. But again, the adversity I faced from, from other mums of, oh, she hadn't made them herself, has she? Mm. And it's, and, and actually, I think other women, other, you know, the, there was 
lack of support from certain people there as well, which was quite shocking for me to see, because I, I imagined that it would be very supportive of women supporting other women, yeah. um, knowing that, that we have got a different level of diversity against others. But yeah. um, but I did get sort of some, some backlash of things like that, which yeah. uh, was very, very telling. Um, and, well, really uh, and I remember asking somebody once actually sort of saying, can I just ask, I've, 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 you know, respectfully, I've, you have everybody's got an opinion and that's okay. But you've just spoken about me and spoken like I'm not here and I've actually been standing behind you, which is actually quite funny because she was mortified that I pulled her up. Um, but I said, that's me you'd be talking about then. Um, but I asked her why, why she felt, genuinely felt that it was wrong of me to not bake a cake because I was, I was paying my children's bills and paying the mortgage and making sure that they could afford all the, the football lessons and the quick lessons that, that they, they, you know, that we have for them. Um, that'll cost money and it's me that provides that. So why did she feel the need to go and say it in like, it's a bad thing mm. that I wasn't there picking up and dropping off. I said, you know, would you consider swapping with her? Well, no, no, because he has too much money. Said, well, so do I. Yeah. But why is another female? Do you think it's wrong that I want to mm. have children, that I want to have a career I want to continue to have a great career. Yeah. I want to go into a senior role. Yeah. I travel halfway around the world. And so sometimes I'll have, at that time it was Skype, I will have dinner with my children over Skype. I'll be in a restaurant on my own. They'll be on Skype. They'll be having their dinner. I'll be having mine. Um, and it was a way of connecting still. Yeah. Um, but but I wasn't physically in the room because that's what my job demanded at the time. Yeah. Um, but I did ask her and said, why? And she, she couldn't answer me. She was just, um, well, well, just that's what's done around here. I was like, well, it's not done in my world. So right. you stick in your lane and I'll stick in mine. But um, am I, because I challenged her whether she thought I was a bad parent because I work full time in a senior role. Mm. And her answer to that was, well, if you, if you have kids, you should be bringing them up yourself. And so that, that was the honest answer she gave me. And I didn't like the answer at the time. And of course, I went home and I was very, very upset that day, thinking, mm. am I failing as a mum? Should I be at home? I started then question what I was doing and why I was doing it. And was I selfish? Yeah. Women are made to feel selfish if they choose a career, yeah. whereas nobody says to a guy, you're being selfish if you want a career, but they do when it's a woman. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, topic that I'm very passionate about. I could go no, on I think that, Sorry, I mean, <laughs> no, not at all. I find it fascinating because, I mean, I, I actually... Um, I kind of don't follow in what's often called a bit of a kind of cult following of Jordan Peterson. Um, but I am, I, I do sort of hop in and out of his stuff now and again. And, and he's a big advocate for, he talks about um, e equality of outcome and equality of opportunity. Uh, and, he, and, he, and he just says, you know, we, 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 we oversimplify equality. We just say equality, that's it. Um, and for me, the, translating what you're talking about into his work is that, it's it's ultimately not desirable to have a quality of outcome because it's impossible, he talks about. Because um, what you've got there is that, that some of the mums on the schoolyard, they, they want to do that. And some other ones in another schoolyard somewhere will be more like yourself that want to have the career and want to do that. And, and they've made a choice and a decision with their, with their spouses, their, their own husbands or wives or whoever else, to then look after the kids. Um. Whereas he says the, the equality of opportunity is the crucial one. It's the choice. You and all those other mums, you've all got the opportunity to choose a career over being that full-time mum. You've all got the opportunity to choose to be the full-time mum instead of the career. Yeah. But then with your own contextual family circumstances, your own relationships that you have, you then decide the outcome of that what what is actually going to happen and you know the pressure to choose one way or the other and the judgment of having chosen one way or another is 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 a, a significant pressure on on women in the workplace i, I believe in, in the choices mm -hmm. they make there's always going to be someone unfortunately that judges you for either oh you could be a better parent but if you were doing that there's someone else that will judge you and says oh why aren't you a career woman you've been stuck at home is the, the husband keeping you there or something it's crazy yeah absolutely yeah crazy. no so, so it's it's all been part of uh, part of the journey of um yeah. i say and, and people just fascinate me on what they say and how they behave and things so mm. um again it came back to uh, fueling me on rather than um I, you know i'm, I'm not uh, a robot I, I feel it sometimes but not often um but then i i came back and stopped 
sort of overthinking it and said, no, I chose to have a career. I have a brain. Mm-hmm. I'm a good mum. My, I love my children. Um, and actually the lessons that they learn that, that when you work hard, you have nice things, you get good rewards. Um, and actually about the things that they learn, I, you know, as, as they're adults now, they're 18, 21, I did go back and I said to them, guys, mm-hmm. do you feel that you've missed out on anything because I worked full time? Um, and actually both come back and said, no, you work really hard and actually respected that you worked really hard. Um, and because of what you do, the impact that you have when you help other people, had you have not done that, the world would have been, you know, the people that you've helped along the way, you, they, they, you know, you wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, and even now when I'm on LinkedIn stuff, well, I'll show them some of the big posts where it's oh. like four and a half million views and, and everything else and they go out. So, and, and the whole point is I do that one or two things. If it can help somebody or change their thinking or get them to reach out and speak to somebody about something, which they do, um, then I've done what I've set out to do, which is have an impact because my daily mantra is go mad. Yeah. So most people who know me will say I'm mad to the of frogs, um, but <laughs> mad stands for make a difference. So each day I get up and go, okay, you know, today I will make a difference. And then the end of each day, I said to myself before I go to bed, what difference did I make today? Whether that's in at home, uh, in the workplace, as myself, as an individual who you know despite being 50 is still growing is still yeah. learning is still developing um i don't think you'll ever get to the place where i say yeah i'm a ready-made article because i'm not no. and i still push myself um at times far too hard i i know that i'm, I'm guilty of that and i know that especially as suppose i lecture other people about not pushing themselves too hard too quickly <laughs> um so i don't always take my own advice um but um but yeah so um, yeah, so that's my mantra, and that's what I stick with every day. Is, and that's, a, that's a positive role model for the kids. You know, the fact that you're going out there yeah. and, and you are you are helping people and offering that support. Um, and I, you know, I'm deliberately not saying female role model. You're a role model <laughs> for them, yes. whether whether you're female or male. It, it's completely irrelevant. Um, you're, you're offering support out there that is actually, you know, they they see that and growing up to see that the good that we've done with it. What, what's a, that's great parenting. How, how, yeah. how can anyone say that you failed as a parent if, by doing that? That's, that's awesome. Yeah, um, they've turned out amazing. I'd love to take the credit for it, but not. They're, 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 they're good boys. You've got to take some of the credit for it. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they are great. They I'm are sure they'd nice. give they're you some of the ones. credit. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, really enjoyed that conversation, Lisa. Um, we've come to the part of the show where I'd like to kind of go back and say, um, choose the title. So obviously we're leadership untitled and we kind of like reviewed the conversation that we've had and come up with what we think would be a, a good title for the episode. As usual, you've probably seen me scribbling some notes as we've been talking. Uh, yeah. I've got a few ideas, but I don't like to to, to share those first for, for sakes of guiding. So is there anything there? Is there anything no. that jumps up that you think? No, go with what feels right. Well, some of the notes I've made there are two, two particular, and they're actually the same two notes I wrote um, last time we spoke when okay. thinking about what the title might be. Um, yeah. You've got the power to influence and you've got go mad or any mixture thereof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> again, um, either, um, either, but uh, again, you know, the go mad is, is my mantra is what I'm known for. Um, it's what I uh, uh, seek to do every day. Um, and I think it's important that, um, again, when you're in the HR role, I think it's important that people take that role seriously. It's not an admin role. Yeah. It's not a people process role. There'll be environments where people just do. They just process in. They have an inbox in and an inbox out. Yeah. Um, and for that, they can call themselves what they like. Um, but I don't think they should call themselves, um, you know, human in any part of that. That might be. Uh, it could be a number of things. But um and, and in terms of like human resources, I don't like the word, never have done. Yeah. Um, but that's why I say I put the human back into HR, you know, making sure that we understand the business, we understand the people, and we run decisions based on people centric, um, heart shaped decisions. Yeah. Um, because they make for a better outcome, which means smarter business which means for the business, a better outcome. So it's not that I'm pink and fluffy and like unicorns no. and, and clouds, all of this, this mad stuff that I talk about, um, you know, it can be the difference between a good business and yeah. a really great one. Yeah. It can be the difference between success and failure. It can be the difference between having um, average, mediocre, just people who can do the job versus actually attracting the very, very best talent. Um, and, and I'm all for that. So, yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, kind of just as, a, as a, an appendix on it there, I just thought, is it, is it go mad and be human? Yeah. Yeah, could be. Right. Yeah, there go mad go. and being human. Yes. Be human. <laughs> Perfect. That <laughs> That's what it will be. Um, uh, if people would like to, if they're not already following you, Lisa, um, if people like to find out more about what it is you do and what you offer and just your, your general opinion on a daily basis, what's the best way for them to get in touch and see what you're up to? Uh, yeah, so if anyone wants to connect, they'll find us on LinkedIn and if they can't find me, they can find me for you. Um, lots of people look for me and go, I can't find you and say it's because it, my name is H E. Hagger, H-A-G-G-A-R. Lots of people do E-R. So yeah. uh, that's why they go, well, I can't find you anywhere. But um, but yeah, so if anyone wants to join uh, and connect with us, then that's great. Um, and of course, if you work in HR, I run a very successful um, HR network called the HR Couch, yep. uh, which again is about collaboration. We have regular speakers. Um, we challenge, we collaborate. Um, and also there's a lots of areas within a building page where we have um, almost a Dropbox of, you know, um, any documents, any ideas, anything that adds value to people's life. There's no point in us reinventing the wheel individually. So a lot of people I speak to are in standalone roles. So if they need a document, let's not have 50 is writing one document, let's write it twice. And then people can use a 10% and tweak it for their own workplace and things. So we're trying to provide and build up some, some resources as well that are free. Um, and again, so, so a network and a community mm -hmm. um, in every sense of the word. So it's not run by recruiters. So there's nobody going to be uh, in your inbox trying to upsell everything to you. There's, there's no agenda there. Um, it's really just about that collaborative piece. So it's probably a little bit different than they used to. Um, and we've had yeah. three sessions so far. They've been a lot of fun, a lot of energy um, and shocking in parts, but in a good way. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if you want traditional, you know, dry and boring, don't dial in. If you want sort of fresh thinking, real people talking about real things, um, uh, then, yeah, we would love to have you on the couch as well. And correct me if I'm wrong, but obviously they can find the information on that through your posts and right, looking at that. Yeah. But you can also, have, I believe it's it, the booking is through Eventbrite, so they can find the events on there also. Yes, they can. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I think I'll, the next um, one's in mid May, so keep an eye out for that one. Fantastic. What I'll do is I'll pop the uh, I'll pop the links for your profile and uh, uh, and for the website and uh, uh, the Eventbrite onto the show notes so people can click directly on there and they don't have to search for your last name then and misspell it. Yeah, that's correct. They Thank get you. straight to you. Uh, you get even more <laughs> messages every day. It's been great. No, it really is. Well, it gets overwhelming being disconnected. It does get overwhelming at times, um, but it's still a privilege. And even yeah. when I can't help people, I try to. Um, get others who can so there's a number of us that can all help out as well but but I rest assured that what I post is from me it's not from a VA it's not made up from I don't have a team of people who support me doing that what you see is what you get and it's all very genuine uh, some of my responses are you're not speaking to me as in part of my team you are speaking to me it's me that messages you back and I know that some people have teams because they're so busy and I get that but for the authenticity piece I will um, sometimes offshoot other work uh, but I won't with that. I, I won't let that one go. That has to be me because, mm. again, it comes back to that transparency, um, integrity, okay. and yeah, yeah, it has to be real. So that is me. What you see is what you get. Brilliant. That, that could have been the title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, might have a, I might have a subtitle. <laughs> <laughs> Really yeah, seven with me, we? <laughs> well, I've really enjoyed that. Thank you so much for your time today, Lisa. I've really enjoyed you, and thank you for coming along. Yeah, no, it's been great and it's always good to, sometimes you, you're on podcasts and you're chatting away and you forget that you've been recorded. It's just like a lovely conversation. Um, so I hope aim. people get, um, you know, get something from this. Um, in the same way as obviously if anybody from HR is struggling um, with confidence, with sort of how to influence, we, you know, we will do some stuff. And actually, Rob, I think there's, there's a couple of things that you and I should collaborate on in the future um, mm. to, to reach out and, and get it, you know, get an even bigger audience to, to help. Um, so because I think the power of influence is a very strong thing um, and there's not many people who do it very well. So, um, yeah, there's lots of things that we can help them with. Fantastic. Yeah, let's, let's right. keep in touch and uh, yes. help the world. Yes, indeed. Really One person at a time, as they say. Yeah, well, yeah, but sometimes <laughs> that's the best way because there, as Dr. Sam Beckett, Quantum Leap, used to say, it yeah. was uh, in the case of one person affects another person and that person affects another person. You don't just help the one person yourself. So that's brilliant. Great stuff. Uh, yeah. Have a fantastic day and uh, we'll speak soon. So that brings us to the end of this episode of the Leadership Untitled Podcast. This episode will be called Go Mad, Be Human. 
That's a tribute to Lisa's mad mantra, which is make a difference. All that remains is to again thank Lisa for joining me today and sharing her experiences and insights with you guys, and also thanking you yourselves for listening. If you'd like to know more, then Lisa's details are in the show notes. And also, if you'd like to know more from me, take a look at the website or email me, rob at robmores.com and the website of the same name. Until next time, don't forget to subscribe. I'll speak soon. Bye-bye now.